If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me, please, to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. It said, And the king and his men, speaking of David, went to Jerusalem and to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, Thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, and the same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter, smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind, that doesn't mean that David disliked or hated the lame and the blind. He was merely throwing back into the teeth of Satan that which had taunted him because the Jebusites had said, you'll never take the city. Even the lame and the blind can hold you off. You'll never take it. And David said, whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Speaking of the temple when it would be built. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. We do not war after the flesh. Notice the terminology. Christian, you're in a battle. We do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare, and it is a warfare that you're in. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want to use for a subject, preaching a few minutes tonight, pulling down strongholds. Would you bow your heads, please? Pulling down strongholds. Heavenly Father, as I minister, I would ask in the name of Jesus that your spirit would work its intended and necessary work in this place. I ask for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I ask tonight that you would help me to preach, for it's by the foolishness of preaching that you have chosen to use in your august wisdom to bring men to thee. I pray that you would anoint these people to hear, and not only these that are here, but those that watch by television. And Heavenly Father, I will ask it all in the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen and Amen. I am convinced in my mind and spirit, totally, that this that I believe God would have me bring to you tonight is the very heart of the gospel. It is actually the battleground of your soul. I believe with all of my heart after 25 years of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and observing and watching and looking and seeking, the face of Almighty God. That this area that I trust God will help me to bring to you is where it is. If you lose it here, you've lost it all. If you make it here, you've made it all. The Bible tells us in Romans 6 and 14 that sin shall not have dominion over us. And when the Apostle Paul wrote those words under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he meant exactly what he said. And yet, as I read to you, 
other words from the Apostle Paul, he spoke of warfare. Warfare that is so serious and so severe that your eternal soul is at stake. And Jesus said of your soul that it's worth more than all the world. And in bringing this to you, I felt that God laid down a pattern for us in his word in 2 Samuel. I feel that it typifies exactly who we are, where we are, and what we're doing. It reads every chapter in our book. It's down to the nitty gritty. It's down to where we're living. But thank God the Holy Ghost doesn't desert us when we have to get down in the mud and fight with the powers of darkness. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's when he really gets ready to go. We shout the praises of God and the Holy Spirit is definitely in that. But he's with you greater when you're fighting your hardest. All right now. I could go into a long dissertation over how to fight and how you should not fight and how you shouldn't fight Satan but fight the good fight of faith and all of that. But it wouldn't make too much difference. You know you've been in a battle whatever you're fighting. So I'll just leave that aside. David had just been elected by God to take the throne of Israel having been selected some 12 years previously. Israel in the Old Testament is a type, an earthly type of our spiritual redemption. The promised land was a foreshadow, a type, an allegory of what we have in Christ Jesus today, spiritually speaking. When he took the throne, he did not take a throne that was gilded and golden and august, but he took possession of a throne that was torn to pieces by strife, a nation that was split in two, a nation that had known defeat after defeat by the Philistines and had come through years of evil and wickedness under Saul, and that's what David stepped into. When you come into the kingdom of God and get saved, we use that term, born again, saved by the blood of Jesus. Oddly enough, in spite of how much we preachers talk about it, you step into the middle of the biggest conflict that you have ever known in all of your existence. Now that's not good psychology, is it? Some of you are sitting here tonight wondering whether to accept Jesus, and some preacher tells you if you accept the Lord, you're just about to step into a hornet's nest. That's not good PR work, is it? But it's the truth. It's the truth. Simply because God is getting you ready. He's getting you ready for something that is so august and so, so great that it beggars description. One day you will judge angels. Hallelujah. One day as kings and priests, you will reign with Christ Jesus. This world is not going to go to the communist. It's not going to go to the devil. It's not going to go to hell. It's not going to go to the powers of darkness. But Jesus Christ is its owner and he is coming back and we shall rule and reign with him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, if you want to settle, sinner friend, for nothing, stay where you are. If you want to be a loser, stay where you are. If something in your heart doesn't reach out for the thrill of being more than what you are now, just sit still. 
But if you're tired of wasted years and broken promises and dreams that never come true, and you want to catch a hold of a power that is greater than every power on the face of this earth, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Catch a hold of the hand of Jesus, and I'll promise you it'll be a life that is abundant and glorious and wonderful and above anything the heart or the mind begin, could begin to imagine. You talk about excitement, it's excitement personified. Now, now, admittedly, religion within itself is cold, dead, Lifeless, lackluster, lackadaisical, dead. And I don't blame you for not wanting it. I don't blame you for shying back from it like a calf looking at a new gate. I don't blame you. It'll kill you. But Christianity is not religion. Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's a relationship with Jesus. Now, it's up to you. You can stay down in the mundane, settle for the crumbs that Satan will throw you. Give you a little thrill and it ceases to satisfy and you look for a little more and you grab a little drugs here and a little alcohol there and a little illicit sex here and you think you're living. But there's something better. There's something better. There's something better. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I'm going to be honest with you. When you come in, it's like the Marines. They only want a few good men. <laughs> He'll take anybody. Doesn't matter who you are, Jesus. Doesn't matter where you're from, crippled, weary, worn, and sad. He'll take your sins away. He'll change your life. But if you think you're going to step in and it's going to be nothing but roses, I'm going to be honest with you, it's not going to be that way. It takes a man to live for God. It takes somebody that's got some, some strength in their backbone to live for Jesus. The rest are on drugs. The rest are on alcohol. The rest are on those green felt gambling tables in Las Vegas and Atlantic City trying to win something. You don't have to win something. Jesus won it all 2,000 years ago. All right, but when you get in, you get into the most glorious, wonderful, beautiful, fulfilling experience that the human heart could ever comprehend or realize. However, you've got an adversary. He's called the devil. And you listen to some preachers and they say, rebuke him and he'll flee. And you rebuke him and he don't buke. <laughs> he doesn't run at ease, have you noticed? And he takes a look at you and he sizes you up. And he says, well, you're saved, huh? You're born again, huh? And he looks for a little weak spot, a little mushy spot. And he finds it. You hear me? It's called jealousy or envy or malice or bitterness or pride or gossip or lust or filth, wickedness. Unbelief, doubt. He keeps probing for it till he finds it. You say Christians have those things? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Christians have those things. They have those problems. Let's talk about it a moment. Pride. Christians have pride? Yes. 
Jealousy? Yeah, Christians have jealousy. The husband just greets the lady. She walks down the street. And his wife gives him a piece of her mind twice. <laughs> Somebody's already got it. Pride, jealousy, envy, malice, all of these things, the devil looks for them, see. But the wonderful thing about it, Jesus doesn't even think about giving up on you. Even though those problems are there, instead of the Holy Spirit running, he digs in, see. He digs in to combat the forces of darkness, and you've got a power that you've never had before. But just because the Lord is there and the power of the Holy Spirit is there doesn't mean that all of these problems are going to disappear. They aren't. Those problems are going to dig in. Satan wants to ensnare you with them. And I've been a tiny bit humorous with you, but listen to me. Unless you get victory over those problems, they will eventually get victory over you. Now, there was a city right in the middle of Israel. It was called Jabus. That city, they tell us, sits in the exact geographical center of the world. It's still there. It's now called Jerusalem. It's one of the oldest cities on the face of the earth. In your Bible in Genesis, it was called Salem. Then it was changed to Jabus became the inhabitants of one of the most fierce, warlike people on the face of the earth called Jebusites. They were more fierce than the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Hittites. They were more fierce than all of the warring tribes that were so idolizing and heathenistic in their satanic worship, the Jebusites. They were never defeated except by David. Even Saul could not defeat them. I passed the other day on the outskirts of Jerusalem where Saul's headquarters had been. That was a little over 3,000 years ago. And he pitched his tent surrounded by his mighty armies, but in the middle of the promised land. And notice the terminology. Right in the middle of the promised land were these Jebusites. This tawny, sarcastic, warlike, heathenistic, idol-worshipping worshipers of Satan. Right in the middle of the promised land. And some of you in this audience tonight, some of you in this building, you've been saved by the blood of Jesus. And you love the Lord. I'm not doubting that. You love it. And you won't to obey him and do his will, but there is a Jabus right in the middle of your life, a Jabus of pride, of envy, of malice, of concupiscence, of lust, of temper, unbelief, doubt, a Jabus there that Satan nurtures and promotes and taunt you, and some of you in this building, and some of you but television have wept untold tears. And it's, it's with some of you that you wonder, will I ever have victory? Now this is where the battleground is. And I'm not talking about little white lies. I'm not talking about a little slip of the tongue where you get a little red in the face. I'm talking about sin that is so vile and degradating and filthy and hellish that it will destroy your soul. That's what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about lust, sir. Lust, lady, that is so wicked and so evil that is one of Satan's prime movers. That is fostered and nurtured by the world today. Every time you turn on television, on billboards, and our songs, and our music, and almost everything that is done today, sex is one of the hottest commodities in the merchandise marts of this age. (laughs) 
And once Satan hooks you, once, dirty magazines, pornographic movies, you say, Jimmy Swaggart, that's so dirty, that's so rotten, that's so hellish, that's so filthy, no Christian would ever be guilty of such a thing. Honey, that's not so. I don't say it with joy. I don't shout when I say it. I'm talking about where we live. I'm talking about where we live. I'm talking about the powers of darkness. I'm not talking about spiritual tiddlywinks. I'm talking about something so powerful, so strong, that the whole world is in its iron-like grip. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 150,000 abortions in the United States, most of them the result of fornication and adultery. You hear what I'm saying? I'm talking about sin. Some of you would sit here and say, I don't know what you're talking about, Jimmy Swaggart. I know that, but many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've gotten hooked on this rot of hell, this filth of darkness. It's a Jabus in your life, and you have wept until the hot tears have scalded your face. And you don't know how to get out. Some of you look at me and say, Jimmy Swagger, a person couldn't be a Christian and do such a thing. An individual could not be saved. Most preachers won't touch this. They won't touch it with a hundred-foot pole. I'm talking about lust that burns in a man's soul. And today it is as equally prevalent in the heart and life of the female gender as it is in the male gender. A jabus, a jabus. It's the spirit of the age. It's the spirit of the age. Unbelief, doubt, bitterness, jealousy, pride, ugly. And Satan seizes on it. Self-will. That's the heart of all sin, self-will. I want my way. I'll have my way. I will do what I want to do. That was what caused Satan's downfall, his beauty. And he said, I will ascend to the star, above the stars of God. All right. When David became king, this mess, this glut, this polyglot, this rot of hell was dumped into his lap. Jabus. I believe it's the 76th Psalm that bears it out. Bible scholars feel that Jabus was so powerful, even the Egyptians were scared of them, the mighty Egyptian army. They were so powerful that they felt there was no fear of them ever being taken. Satan wants to erect a stronghold in your life, Christian, a stronghold that gets bigger and bigger and every time you yield to his insidious devices you get a little weaker and he gets a little stronger god does forgive if you go to jesus 50 times and ask forgiveness a hundred times a thousand times he'll forgive you but you get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and satan gets stronger and stronger and stronger and then he starts to tell you the evil one there's no hope for you You'll never make it. David, the first act he committed when he became king, he recognized that rot within his country, Israel, Jabus, the Jebusites, and he said they've got to go. Now, if you want victory, I want to tell you from that word of Almighty God how to have victory. First of all, you must do the same identical thing that David did. You must recognize that you've got a problem. You have hidden it, glossed it over, 
petted it long enough. You've made allowances for it, amends for it. You've tried to think it's not nearly as bad as it is, but one of the problems of the world today is that it refuses to recognize the horribleness of sin. The world does not really believe that sin is as bad as it is. Mister, you don't think that sin will destroy your family. You can play around, be unfaithful to your wife and children, and you can get by, you think. You think I'm no different after the act than before it. Nobody will ever know. That's Satan's ploy. You won't get by. It will eventually destroy you. First of all, as a child of God, you've got to come clean with God. You've got to re realize that thing in your life is ugly. It's dirty. It's rotten. It's hellish. It's wicked. It's evil. It's damnable. It's deadly. It's dark. And it smells. You've got to realize that. Recognize the thing is there. David didn't hide it. He recognized those Jebusites for what they were. You've got to do the same. But it's very easy for us to look at somebody else and say, they've got a dirty, rotten temper, but mine is just bad nerves. <laughs> Am I right? Jesus had something to say about that, didn't he? He said, before you start digging the moat out of somebody else's eye, look at the cross tie in your own eye. Remember that? You hear what I'm saying? That's the reason those Pharisees got angry with him. The most difficult thing to do is to point the finger inward at me and you. You follow me? That's hard. We don't like to do that. We don't want to do it. We want revival to come, but Lord, everybody else needs revival. They need it so badly. God sent it on us, but I don't need revival. But it's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. <laughs> Recognize the thing. Now, the second thing, David, the Bible said, made up his mind. He said, this day, he didn't say, I'll get victory some other time. I'll whip these Jebusites next year. We'll marshal our forces five years from now. We'll do this. He said, this day, make up your mind. Some of you ought to make up in your, in your mind. In this meeting, I'm going to get victory. I'm coming to get it. God, I'm tired of sliding around on the edge. I want revival within my soul. Make up your mind. Now, listen carefully to me. Your will is the most powerful part of you and at the same time it is the weakest now, that sounds like a contradiction in terms but listen to me your will is the only part of you that god will not touch he will touch your body your heart your soul your spirit, but he will not touch your will. Heaven will bend over backwards to keep from coercing an individual's will. God doesn't want robots, automatons, slaves. He wants those that will serve him willingly. <laughs> willingly. Now that's where the battleground is. The battleground is in your mind. It's in your will. Of course, it flows over to your soul and spirit. Oh, how it does. How it does. Satan, knowing that God will not, with his august power, reach out and stop or bend your will. He won't do that. You say, well, I'm going to give up smoking. God is able to take that cigarette out of my lips. He is, but he'll never do it, honey. You hear me? I'm not going to say what I was about to say. You, you think God with his mighty power 
and he does have almighty power. He's able to do anything, but he'll never touch your will. If you want to get mad, throw a fit, he'll let you do it. If you want to say some slang words or profanity, he'll let you do it. If you want to throw a fit, he'll let you do it. If you want to get pride in your heart, he'll let you do it. It's up to you. So you can't blame God. You can't blame angels. You can't blame anybody else but you. Okay, Satan knows this. Naturally, he does. He will not stop short of your will. Here's the way he ensnares you. He entices with the weaknesses of mankind, illicit sex, drugs, alcohol, and all of these things we could talk about. And if he can get you to bite, then he has weakened your will because he has tied the flesh to your will. And the Bible plainly says the flesh is weak, mister. It's weak. And then you finally get to the place that your will, because of constant repetitive yielding to the powers of darkness, your will cannot overcome your flesh. There are 300,000 heroin users in New York City alone. Most of them would give anything in the world if they could get that monkey off their back, but their will isn't strong enough. You can't do that. Won't work. Millions of alcoholics would do anything within their power to lay the bottle down, but they can't. This is what makes sin so hideous, so horrible, so hellish. That's why, that's the way, that's the very, this is the very root of darkness. Satan preyed upon this with Adam and Eve. God said, any tree in the garden, but don't you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan tantalized Adam and Eve with that one tree. And you yield. And that Bible says, all have yielded. Oh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And now, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, it, it doesn't make any difference. You say, well, if I'm a Christian, this thing won't overcome me. It'll overcome you just as quick as a Christian as it will that person has never heard of God. You hear what I'm saying? God doesn't build a wall all around you and you're not an untouchable. He puts you out here, stands you up against the world. Sometimes you feel naked and alone. In you, there is a power that is greater than all the powers of darkness. But you say, Jimmy Swaggart, I don't understand. I'm saved. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues. I go to church. I do this. I do that. But I still yield to that rotten thing, whatever it may be. Oh, we've got a problem now, haven't we? You say, that doesn't happen. Honey, it happens all the time. It shouldn't happen, but it happens all the time. And you weep and you cry and you sob and hell breaks loose in your soul. I'm getting down there to where you live, see. Down in the dirt and the mud because all sin is down in the mud. Some of you are leaning forward on your chair wondering what I'm going to say next. Wondering just how far I will go. And now you will. You want God to stop your will. You want him to, you, you pray, God, change my mind. Take the desire away for, for the thing. God, help me that I don't want it anymore. But he doesn't do it. Oh. Have you noticed that? He doesn't do it. So what hope is it? You make up your mind and say, God, and it's hard to do. I'll admit the desire for that whatever it is, foul, filthy, degrading, rotten, devilish, horrible, hideous, hideous thing, it's there. You don't like to admit it, see. 
I remember about 10 years ago, I went to hear a preacher preach. I won't call his name. It's none of your business. <laughs> Some of you just love to have a party line, wouldn't you? And I made some remarks about him. It wasn't good. I said some things I shouldn't have said. Here I am loving Jesus, preaching every night of my life, almost laying on my face, praying all the time. And I read him the right eye, not to his face. Those kind of remarks are never said to anybody's face, see. I didn't sleep all night. I mean, I didn't sleep all night long and about, well, a little, really before daylight, I got out of that bed, went out to pray and I said, God, I've got to ask you to forgive me. I'm sorry. I did wrong. Please forgive me. There was nothing. Zilch. You ever prayed, did that? Nothing. Communion still broken. I said, Lord, and I, I got scared. I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever I can't get through to God, honey, I'm scared. I'm not scared of you, but I'm scared when that connection's broken. I get worried fast. And I, 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 I said, Lord, your word says, 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said, that's my word, and I mean every word of it. I said, Lord, will I ask you to forgive me? And I can sense in my spirit I'm not forgiven. He said, you sure aren't. <laughs> Why? I, was, I, I still see the place in a prayer room. I was down on my knees, my face on the floor, squalling. That old heavy, you know when you, you can tell it when you're forgiven, can't you? You can tell it. Honey, if you can't tell when you're forgiven, you might not know when you sin. And if you didn't know when you got it, you might lose it and not know you lost it. He said, do what my word said to if we confess our sins. I didn't want to say, Lord, Jimmy Swaggart was guilty, is guilty of pride. I didn't want to say that. It was ugly. I choked on it. I just wanted to gloss over it and say, Jesus, forgive me. And never called the name of the thing. And when I said, Jesus, I'm sorry, forgive me of the sin of pride, he instantly forgave me and cleansed me. But that, that is, it's not as bad as some of the things I've been talking about here. You get to the place, you cry, God, change me. And he doesn't do it. Isn't he able? You better know he's able. Will he not do it? Yes, you better know he will do it. But you have to go his way. His way. You've got to say, God, it's ugly, it's dirty, it's rotten, it's filthy, it's hellish, it's wicked, and I can't overcome it myself. I've got to admit it. I'm not big enough to do it. It's whipping the daylights out of me. It's destroying my soul, my heart, my victory, my communion with God. You've forgiven me over and over again, and I can't, I want the thing, everything in me wants it. And God, I can't lie about it. You know it's there. But I am asking you to help me to go thy way. Whether I want it or not, I want to go your way. And then that thing can be whipped and defeated within your heart and within your life. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. When you get a person with their mind made up, You've got a lethal weapon on your hands then. It's like the lady, her husband came in drunk, halfway tore her coat off of her. So Wednesday night, she was on her way to prayer meeting. He said, I'm so sick of this God, this Jesus, this Bible, this church stuff, I'm sick of it. It's so all I hear in this house is Jesus, Bible, prayer, church. I'm tired of it, woman. Get undressed. You're not going to church tonight. 
She took the torn coat off and put a little sweater on it because that's the only coat she had. He said, woman, you didn't hear me. He pulled a 38 revolver out of the drawer, said, I'll blow your head off if you walk out that door. Now what are you going to do? She said, you pull that trigger and I'm going to heaven. If you don't, I'm going to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Make up your mind. I'm living for God. Make up your mind. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Make up your mind. I'm going through with Jesus. Make up your mind. Hell, you are a defeated foe. Make up your mind. Jesus is victorious. Jesus is all powerful. Make up your mind. Whosoever will. Make up your mind. Filth and rot. And the powers of darkness will not whip me. Make up your mind. Those Jebusites are going. They're going one way or the other, but they are going. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're going. They're going. I'm going to have victory. My preacher may say I can't have it, but I'm going to have it. The devil may say I can't have it, but I'm going to have it. Hell may say I can't have it, but I'm going to have it. I'm going to have victory in Jesus. Make up your mind. And when you make up your mind, then God goes to work with you. When you sit around and wallow around, well, I don't know. We've got to sin a little bit every day. We just can't help it. I'm just a poor old sinner saved by grace. I don't know what I'm going to do. Stand up like a man. Hold your head high. Look the devil right square in the eyeballs and say, I'm a child of the living God. Satan, I've bitten your bait the last time. I've fallen for your lies the last time. I've made up my mind. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going through with Jesus. I'm going to have victory by the power of Almighty God. Make up your mind. Hallelujah. 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 Make up your mind. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Make up your mind. David said, you come against me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of all the armies of Israel. Make up your mind. The Hebrew children said we might burn, but we'll never bow. Make up your mind. And honey, nobody can do it for you. And I want to preach to you by television for about three or four minutes now. I want you to listen to me. Some of you are sitting back, and I'm talking to Catholics, I'm talking to Protestants, I'm talking to independents, and I'm talking to dependents. You can sit back in that old cold mausoleum that you call the church that doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in the Bible and doesn't believe in Jesus and doesn't believe in the Holy and doesn't believe in anything. And you can say, well, it's not my responsibility. And you're going to wind up in hell, too. That's blunt, isn't it? But I'm telling you the truth. Make up your mind. I'm living for God. It may cost me my friends. It may cost me my loved ones. It may cost me my job. It may cost me my mama. It may cost me my daddy. They may kick me out of my church. They may turn the lights out on me. I may lose everything I've got, but I've made up my mind. I'm living for Jesus, and I'm going to have victory, and I'm going through all the way. The devil's not going to destroy my soul, my heart, my life. I've made up my mind.
Now, I'm sorry if I offend some of you. You see, I, I'm doing my best to jar some of you. Some of you have been sitting there in that old spiritual easy chair so long, you just overflow. <laughs> Trying to get you out of that old seat of lethargy. And wait for the preacher to do it for you. And that's one of the problems. Now, I've been, I've been hitting on some others. I want to kind of meddle with the Pentecostals a little bit now. And I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to warn you. I'm out for blood tonight. You know what the Pentecostal problem is? Pentecostals want somebody else to do it for them. Oh, what do you mean? What do you mean want somebody else to do it for them? Have a prayer line and everything in the world gets in it. So somebody can lay hands on you and anoint you with oil and do your work for you. You don't believe in prayer lines? Oh, yes, I believe in prayer lines. You don't believe in anointing with oil? You better believe I believe in anointing with oil. You don't believe in deliverance? You better know I believe in deliverance. But friend, if you think you're just going to sit back and loll around and let some preacher dump oil on you and all of a sudden you're going to suddenly sprout wings. <laughs> you're mistaken, honey. It's not going to work that way. The only difference will be you'll just be oiled up. There's no shortcuts. I can see David now. I love David. He was a singer. Played a harp. But honey, he wasn't no sissy. I want to tell you that. If you was looking for lace on his drawers, you could have looked somewhere else, mister. He was a man full of the power of God. Some of you woke up then. <laughs> and I can see him standing out there because he was not only a singer and a musician and a psalm writer, which was a songwriter, he was a warrior. When you get up every morning and the devil looks at you, what does he see? Come on now thinking, oh, my Lord, I don't want to face another day. Mmm, it's bad. I don't know what I'm going to do. The country's in recession, and my Lord, the government's going to cut my check off. I don't know what in the world that's going to happen to me. I've had it. I'm going to lose my job, sure as the world. I don't know what in the world's going to happen. The world has always had its problems. It's had its Caesars, uh, and its presidents, and its Charlemains, uh, and its depressions, and its recessions, uh, but you are not of this world. You're in it, but you are not of it. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You're a Christian. You're a child of the living God. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. You may not be perfect, but you are hooked up with one that is. And there is a power in you that's greater than all the powers of hell. Victorious. Made up my mind I'm going to get victory over that temper. I'm going to get victory over that pride. I'm going to get victory over that jealousy. I'm going to get victory over that lust. I'm going to do it now. And David stood out there and that bunch of Jebusites leaned over the wall and started to taunt him. You can hear Satan snap in it. You'll never take it. You'll never get into this fort. The mighty Saul couldn't whip us. You couldn't do it. I don't care what you do. We can, we can post our cripples up here, dragging a cripple leg in our blind and our halt, and you couldn't even whip them. 
Hallelujah. Doesn't it sound like the devil? You've had it, mister. You'll never make it. It's rough. It's all going to pot. It's going down to tubes. Satan says, here we are and here we stay. And David said, you're going. And I made up my mind because my soul hates this thing. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Now I'm going to preach to you for about three minutes. I'm running out of time. Hang in there with me. Some of you little Christianettes have got to hold on for a while. You just might as well make up your mind. You're not going to get home in time to watch soap or something that's on like that. We've got a very spurious gospel that's going around preached by some of the biggest preachers that all you're supposed to do is just love everything. Don't ever say anything about anybody. No matter how evil they get, just love them and don't dare mention their sin. I wish that somebody had told Jesus that. Oh, my. Because when he stood in front of those Pharisees, he didn't say, now, you wonderful, little, beautiful God's children. <laughs> You're not too bad. Come on now, we can all go the same way. Doesn't matter what you believe, just so you believe something, come on now. I'm going to make the door big enough to where everybody can get in, because I love you. Is that what he did? Uh-uh. The poor woman in adultery, writhing on the ground, he said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Hallelujah. The woman at the well that had five husbands. Hallelujah. He never said a word of accusation against her. He just said, you're talking to the Messiah. I am the son of the living God. Hallelujah to the Christ. And the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And though may we as vile as he wash all our sins away. Oh, but when he faced those hypocritical, two-bit, four-flushing Pharisees. And, and they were religious. All the time they're religious. I don't have many of the world that gets mad at me. They know I'm telling the truth. A poor old drunk out there living in hell, he'll write me and say, God help us, Jimmy Swaggart, keep on preaching it. You hear me? The poor old drug addict will write me and say, for God's sake, don't let up. The kids will write me and say, tell it just like it is. You know who I get the flack from? You know who I get the flack from? These four flesh and two-bit hypocritical Christians uh, that profess it and don't possess it. I've never preached as hard as Jesus preached, never have. He said, you snakes. That's hard, mister. <laughs> that's, that's hard. He said, you vipers, you hypocrites. Outside, you're all washed up. Inside, you smell, you stink. You're full of dead men's bones. I didn't know he preached like that. <laughs> yes, he did, mister. Why do you think they killed him? For putting candles on their birthday cakes? 
They killed him because he stood right up to them and said, you close the door, you won't enter in yourself, and you stop everybody else from going in. You're full of the devil. Your father is not God. If your father was God, you'd love me, he said. You'd know me, but your father is the devil. And because your father is the devil, his works you will do. My Lord, that's rough, isn't it? That's rough. I've never gotten that rough. Never have. I've preached hard. I've made some folk angry with them, but I've never gotten that rough. But I'm going to tell you this, TV audience, listen to me. One day when you stand before God and you barely make it through, washed by the blood of the Lamb, you're going to thank your God somebody stood up and told you and pointed a finger at you and told you just like it was, just like that old Bible says it is, and didn't pull any punches or spare any horses. You're going to be glad. Hate it. You can't love something unless you have the opposite. You can't know what love is until you also hate something. You've got to hate everything that is the opposite of love. If you don't do it, you don't love. The man that'll stand up and say everything is all right with you when you're dying with cancer, and a doctor that'll put a little band-aid over you and send you home and give you an aspirin tablet, tablet he doesn't love you. And a preacher that'll stand behind a pulpit and pat you on the back and tickle your ears and get you to like him because he tells you everything's all right when you're dying. He doesn't love you. Catholics, I love every one of you. And because I love you, I'm going to tell you. You can confess to the priest. You can light all the candles you want to light. You can do all of these things, but it won't save you. You've got to go to Jesus Christ and ask God through Jesus Christ to cleanse you your sins, save your soul, and wash you by the blood of Jesus. Am I mean? Am I angry because I say that? No. I say it because I love you. Jesus said, you hate me because I speak the truth. All right, I've got to hurry. I've got to quit. <laughs> then David said, the lame and blind will never enter in it. He wasn't speaking harshly of the lame and the blind. Don't misunderstand. But it was a spiritual application that I don't, I don't really have time to enlarge upon because in the old Levitical Jewish law, the Mosaic law, those that were crippled, those that were blind, those that were, had all type of physical problems, they could not administer in the service of the Levites, even though they might have been a Levite. They could not function because they had to stand upright as a, an example of Christ in every way. Not meaning that you that have physical disabilities are being spoken of has nothing to do with you, period meaning any spiritual cripple, you've got to get victory over that thing. All right now, as I close. David, the Bible said, took that city. God helped him to take it. And God will help you when you make up your mind and go in. He took that city and the Bible said he dwelt there. You can have victory over that sin in your life. And that weakness that almost destroyed you can become your strong point until it becomes your strongest stronghold in your life. <laughs> then the Bible said that David went on and grew great. Had he not routed those Jebusites and made Jerusalem his capital, he would have withered and died. Saul never defeated that which was within, and finally that which was without destroyed him. If you don't defeat that which is within, that which is without will eventually destroy you. The other day we received a letter from a man. Turned his back on God. I'll make it very brief, very short. He went down the toboggan slide, down, 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 down. Finally, he was on drugs, and I mean hooked. He finally lost his home, his family, his job, his business, everything, and tried his best to OD on a handful of pills. He took so many pills that the doctors, he didn't, no, no reason, no medical reason why he didn't die. They said, your brain is a scrambled, 
You'll be a half a man, if that, or a walking vegetable. In a hospital bed on a Sunday morning in California, he flicked on the TV set. God used a song that morning, that song that we sing at times, Only Jesus Can Satisfy Your Soul. The Spirit of God reached out through it and touched him. He said, Lord, I'm sick of this. Change my heart and change my life. I don't have the willpower to do it. I can't. But I know yours is the right way, and I want your way. I want your way. Help me. To make the story very short, he passed an IQ test the other day that was higher than most of us in here. He's in, he's in the seminary now studying for the ministry. That Jabus can be destroyed. You can overcome by the power of God. Bow your heads, please. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we have done our best tonight. We have done our best to preach your word as we've seen it and as we feel it. I ask that your spirit would move in this audience to such an extent that men and women would realize that your ways are the only true ways. Lord, if you'll give people victory tonight, and you are the victory giver, if they mean business and they really want it, they're tired of sin and defeat and failure, and they want to go forward in Jesus, you'll meet them there. You'll meet them there. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. How many in this audience tonight? Jimmy Swaggart, now listen carefully to my words. I'm not living right. Listen to what I say. I am not living right. I need help. I don't want to go on this way anymore. I want victory. I'd almost gotten to the place of believing that it was no hope for me. Satan had made me believe it's useless. But I don't believe that tonight. I believe Jesus loves me, and he does. I don't care who you are and what you've done. He loves you. Would you pray for me? How many will slip up that hand let God see it? I don't care what church you belong to. Maybe you belong to nothing. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you, I don't know, but slip up that hand. I'm not living right. I'll admit it. I'll be honest. I'm not living right. And I need help. All right, I want everyone in this audience to stand, please. Everybody standing, please. All over this vast Colosseum, I want every one of you that raised your hands. I want you to walk down these aisles and stand here. When you walk down these aisles, don't make it just some type of physical exercise, but I want you to come meaning business, because I believe you do. Making up your mind, I'm tired of Satan running over me. I want your best, God. I want all that you have for me. I want it all. Sing it, Thomas, as they come. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble
I want you to look up at Brother Swagger just for a moment now. I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. And there are quite a number here that need to pray it. And I'm going to pray it, and I want you to pray it with me. Believe every word you're saying, and Jesus Christ is going to come into your heart. Secondly, I know that many of you here don't need to do that because Jesus already lives in your heart. But I'm going to ask you to pray it with them, and these out there to pray it with them, just like it'll help them. You don't need it, but it'll help them. Will you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? Now let us pray. And say it out loud with me. Donnie will help you. Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven, I come to you, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. The way I've lived. The way I've lived. And the things I've done. And the things I've done. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Wash me. With your precious blood. With your precious blood. From all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. I'm tired of the old life. I'm tired of the old life. I want a better life. I want a better life. I'm tired of the old man. I'm tired of the old man. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. According to your word. According to your word. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. With my mouth. With my mouth. I confess. I confess. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. In my heart. In my heart. I believe. I believe. That God is raised. God is raised. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. From, the dead. from the dead, and He lives. And he lives. This, very moment, this very moment, I accept, I accept Jesus, Jesus as my Savior. As my Savior. I'll, serve him, I'll serve Him, walk with Him, walk with him love, him, love him, and him, and adore Him. And according to His Word, and according to his word right, now, right now, I'm washed, I'm, washed, I'm cleansed. I'm cleansed I'm redeemed. I'm, redeemed. I'm, saved. I'm saved. Hallelujah.